Simon, as hardly a day goes by, we, don't, we do not talk about football finance and this is another day because the spending cap is on the way to the Premier League for the very first time. But will the devil be in the detail? Premier League clubs have agreed in principle to a cap on spending, the proposal of anchoring as it's called, would mean the top teams spending on transfer wages and agents' fees would be capped at a proportion of the amount the league's bottom club receives in TV money. If anyone can make sense of this, other than your good self, Simon, it's football finance expert Kieran Maguire. And I'm delighted to say that Kieran has joined us live in studio. When you are on with us, Kieran, and you're on YouTube, uh, we're on YouTube and Facebook every morning. I look up there and I see you up there and I always think, oh, he's in his kitchen. Oh, he's in his living room. You're right in front of me here. <laughs> Good morning to you. How are you? I'm, I'm grand. Thanks very much for the invite. Oh, great to see you. So, I mean, can we put this in layman's terms to start with, Kieran? Anchoring, anchoring in layman's terms, what is anchoring? What it's going to involve is you take the amount of TV money received by the, effectively by the club finishing bottom of the Premier League. So last year it was Southampton. They generated £103 million in money from the Premier League TV deal. And then you multiply that by a figure. So let's say it's going to be five. 103 times five gives us a figure of £515 million. And then any club, in theory, in the Premier League can spend up to that amount of money on wages, transfer fee amortisation, agents' fees and player write-downs. Is this a better alternative to the current profit and sustainability rules? Allowable losses of £105 million over three years? It's it's different. I, I think the it's problem different. is it's different. Yeah. It's going to involve more loopholes. I've already heard via at least one club there's going to be an objection to it, a legal challenge. I suspect also that the PFA unless they are brought on board in terms of the discussions, they'll have a legal challenge in exactly the same way that they did when clubs in League One and League Two imposed a, a hard salary cap during COVID. I mean, 16 of the 20 clubs, Simon, voted in favour. Manchester United being one uh, who voted against. United's stance is that there should be no hard cap in the Premier League as it would put English clubs at a disadvantage to the rest of Europe. Can you see their point of view in this? Well, I can see their point of view in terms of where they are economically and what they're able to generate. The fact that the European leagues, in principle, have already started to do this, and the Spanish leagues have started to do this, and some of the intellectual capital behind this is from other leagues in UEFA in the first instance, um, kind of contradicts that argument. But Manchester United and Manchester City will have an objection because Manchester United and Man City are perfectly capable of generating seven, eight hundred million pounds a year as Man City are proving. And if United started to be a bit more successful on the pitch, they would be able to prove as well. So they won't like the idea that a business that can generate eight hundred million pounds a year that can be highly profitable is being told what it can and can't spend spend on areas such as the fundamental cost of football, which is player salaries and player transfer fees. Why, why would Villa vote against it? Again, that's an interesting one because Villa are obviously looking at themselves. I would imagine there's an element of thinking about where they're going, what they want to achieve, American ownership models in one respect, albeit the contradiction in terms is that a lot of this intellectual capital will be coming from an American principle of the draft mechanism being the teams at the bottom get rewarded with the most opportunity. The owners are protected. The, the Whether you play in the Super Bowl, you play in the Super Bowl of leagues because the revenue is shared in a certain way and it makes a, an even more, a more even landscape for the, the franchises inside the NFL and the various different leagues. But certainly Man United and Man City, I would understand their individual point of view. The challenge for them is is they aren't the only voices in the league. Mm. And they've had it for uh, these six clubs or seven clubs that have been able to influence the direction of trouble, travel, with yeah. United and City being leading voices in it, may find themselves in a slightly different position this time around. I mean, Kieran, we know the top team spending on transfer wages and agents' fees would be capped at a proportion of the amount the league's bottom club receives in TV money. So they haven't decided what the multiplier will be. The devil is in the detail. The, what, what's your take on that? I think there's a bit of horse trading that's going to take place. And it could be four and a half times, it could be five times, it could be six times. I, I did the sums yesterday. You know, Clearly, the higher the multiple, the more clubs escape and the more clubs can spend. It has to be remembered that these rules are going to come in and sit alongside the fact that the, the clubs playing in Europe can only spend 70% of their income on, on squad costs and the clubs outside of Europe, 85%. And it's those rules which are applied first and then the anchor comes in as sort of as a backstop. I think the fear is amongst the smaller clubs 
is how can we compete when Manchester City generate £300 million from commercial deals, Manchester United £250 million. They're the two biggest commercial successes in the Premier League, and that's why it's no coincidence that they voted against. Kieran, I'm, I'm sitting thinking, and I think people at home or people everywhere driving around this morning listening to us on Talk Sport might think the same thing and ask the same question. Who's driving this? I think the initial shop steward for this was Steve Parrish at Crystal Palace. Um, from what I now understand, it's Tim Lewis at Arsenal um, who thinks that the, the the acceleration of the two Manchester clubs is so great that for a club such as Arsenal, which has, has sort of fallen behind in terms of its commercial development over the last sort of six or seven years when it's not been in the Champions League, it wants to effectively say... If you're really good at selling you know, Scott McTominay duvet covers or whatever the product's going to be, and Manchester United is, you've only got to go to Old Trafford on a Saturday and you see the success of the megastore, um, we're going to take that out of the equation and we're just going to focus on the TV money. There is an allegation, Sam, and we've spoken about this before, that FFP protects the cartel. No one can compete with them. What does this do? If, if these rules were just being introduced and there was nothing else, it would be absolutely fantastic for those ambitious or aspirational clubs, the likes of Newcastle, um, Villa. You could also throw the likes of Forrest and, and, and Everton into that equation who want to be able to spend as much money as the, as the owners are willing to throw in. Yeah. That, that would be great. I think it's the fact that you've got to satisfy the other rules as well. It won't actually make a lot of difference. Is, has this season turned out we're, we're going to speak the other side of the break with you Kieran because we want to take full advantage of you being with us live in studio has this season been a strange one to for, from your point of view because you're right across everything financial but we've seen what's going on with Everton and Everton will now survive so that's a kind of two fingers to those who are saying uh, Everton uh, financial impropriety Forest have fallen into to difficulties as well um, we know what's hanging over Manchester City Everywhere you go, Kieran, are you approached by people who say, what is going to happen to XYZ Club in a financial sense? Because there's never been a season like it, has there? That, that's right. I mean, I, I was I went to Bournemouth first at Brighton on, on Sunday. And fortunately, nobody wanted to talk about the football because all that people <laughs> want to talk to me about is is the financial side of things. Um, it's, it's not jumpers for goalposts. It's not why we fell in love with the game. But because we've got a couple of extra zeros on the numbers compared to where we were 30 years ago, and the Premier League has been fantastically successful. The revenue's up nearly 3,000% over 30 years. That's for a mature business. That's, that's those incredible numbers. Everybody's now got a view on mm. what what is fair. And I think the the biggest mistake that they've ever made is have this concept of financial fair play because if you are Newcastle, if you are Villa, if you are Everton and Forest, you say, well, it's, it's not fair to us. We, we can't spend as much money as Manchester City or Manchester United or Liverpool or Chelsea. And we've got owners who are willing to put the money in to allow us to do so. Yes. Uh, a spending cap then uh, on the way to the Premier League for the first time. Um, anchoring. Do you think this is fair, Simon? Are you, are you having this? Um, well, you have to pair it back further than say whether it's fair or not. You have to look at the blunt instruments that was brought in to try and find some governance and the motivations behind that. Like everything else, you framed it in a certain way. The question is, why are these rules here? Why did they get brought in? And what is the enforceability of them? And what they're evolving into? The reasons why they were brought in is because I used to think it was about controlling inflation and balancing the opportunity out. And as a former owner, I welcomed them because it would have controlled some of the things that a public domain business sometimes forces you to do. It's not about that. It's about protectionism. It's about the elite pulling the bridge up and saying, we're in the room now, we don't want anybody else there because economically we've, we've achieved what we want to achieve. So financial fair play was brought in under a false premise and I now look at it and say, what is it that we're trying to fix? We have a Premier League which is remarkably successful. Why are we moving into economic asphyxiation? Why are we telling people what they can and can't invest into a football club, into a business that they choose to invest in? There aren't that many casualties inside the Premier League. In fact, there are virtually none. And what we're really talking about is the financial fair play uh, rules being introduced, which is a contradiction in terms. Now you're moving into the terminology profit and sustainability. Where's the sustainability in allowing clubs to be able to spend the money? That they want? It's all ridiculous, and it comes from potentially the ECAs of the world with, dear, with regards to my dear friend Nasser Khalafi and the idea that the, the, the French leagues and the German leagues and the Spanish leagues cannot keep up with the economic powerhouse that's the Premier League. We're trying to fix a problem in the Premier League 
that doesn't exist. Distribution outside of the Premier League? Yeah, by means. Let's have that argument. The EFL isn't getting enough money. Some governance around some of those clubs because of the nature of the configuration of 72 clubs in a pyramid system. Yeah, but what are we doing with our Premier League? And what's fair about it? Mm. Mm. But football has changed. You talked to Alan Sugar yesterday. He'll tell you that the football world has changed. The idea that the cook, the candlestick maker, the baker, the guy in the town that owned the football club and all the players came from the local area and their community assets is what kept football together for so many years. Yeah. But that genie's out of a bottle now. Right, so right. So you do have to pivot. Many people are finding in questions for me to throw to the two of you. Uh, there is Chris. Guys, on the one hand, we have squad cost control, but on the other hand, an anchoring proposal. What, Kieran, takes priority here? The squad cost control will be applied first. And that will say that's the, the maximum amount you can spend in terms of wages, amortisation, agents' fees and, and player write-downs. And then you will apply the, the anchoring as a second. So the anchoring is great because the anchoring applies, you know, every, in theory, it, it's, it's egalitarian, it's democratic. Mm-hmm. Every club, if they want to, could spend £515 million. But you won't be able to do that because the, the squad cost kicks in first. I see. <laughs> You're, you're with Kieran how, this how does, as well, I mean, Simon, just right? Walk, walk me backwards through that. So if you're Crystal Palace and your turnover's 200 million, hypothetically, yeah. and you're allowed to have 170 million of wage um, depreciation wages agent fees, right? But overlaying that, you're allowed to spend 515 million. Which one are you allowed to do? Spend 170 million or 515 million? Does it not affect Palace? It only affects Man United if you want to spend more than 515 million. That's right. So, so Palace will be capped at 170 and therefore the, the anchoring rules won't kick in. If you've got... Let, so let's, will they be able to go above £170 million? Palace won't, no. They'll, so, so, another, so it does protect the cartel? The, 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 the new rules do, because if, if let, let's take Manchester City, £700 million worth of income, 70% of that is 490. Yeah. You've got Palace at 85% of 200, it's 185. Manchester City have got a £300 million advantage before a gold ball is kicked. And... and that's because the rules were introduced. Six into four never went. Seven into four with the potential rise of Newcastle. They don't want that either. Villa, you know, Everton under Mashiri, they, they wanted to spend the money, but they had to go and cut back. It's, it's there to reduce uncertainty because investors like least of all uncertainty. They want guaranteed revenues which was why Super League was so popular. They want guaranteed access as much as they can into the Champions League. So what League. is the sophistication of this? It's one thing introducing a rule, it's another thing enforceable, and the enforceability of it. What we're seeing now is people screaming like stuck pigs because it's moved from financial sanctions into sporting sanctions. Everyone knew what the rules were. Everybody was prepared to accept the rules until the rules came along and started taking points away. So what does this sophisticate... First of all, did, are we going to see a, a list of consequences if people ignore these um, parameters? And what actual sophistication does it achieve? Because it leaves Palace in virtually the same position as they were in before. It leaves all the clubs that are in the middle of the Premier League in the same position as they were in before. Mm. The only people that would potentially have a problem with it is the clubs that are able to generate the huge turnovers because they can retain profitability on, on wages of five or six hundred million pounds if they want to uh, um, by um, the turnovers that they've got. So what exactly is this ultimately sophisticating and achieving? I think it's an internal political issue within Premier League clubs. It's it's fairly well known that the gang of six um, were able to extract concessions yep. from the other clubs with the threat of Super League historically. I think this is the, some of those other clubs, and you know, Palace, I think, were very much at the forefront of it, saying, well, look, those days have now gone. We're going to hamstrung you in, in a similar way to, to the way that you've right. prevented us from spending money historically. I don't see the rules being applied because there won't be any need to, because the squad cost control rules will mm. kick in first. In terms of Chelsea potentially being over the rules last season, if you took a look at Chelsea's wage bill, it was £400 million pounds for, a, for a side that finished mid-table, but included in that was, was Tuchel's payoff and Potter's payoff, yeah. both of which we're talking realistically £10 million pounds plus. You strip those out, and Chelsea would probably fall within the limits. But then anyway. you've got £200 million pounds of a depreciation on player transfers. Those can be, uh, those can be dealt with by. His, we've got the historic long-term amortisation mm-hmm. policy, so it was only signings from the first of July, twenty twenty-three, where you're restricted to five years. Yeah. So 
I, th- I think I Chelsea would be able to. You still, yeah, yeah. they're still going to be plus. I mean, I looked at them before they spent five or six hundred million quid, and they were carrying 65, 70 million pound a season, right, which they were able to bear. But even with the eight-year amortisation and boom, better, there's still going to be a hundred and fifty million pound a season for Chelsea, isn't there? Yeah, one hundred and fifty, I reckon. So they're going to be in trouble at some point, aren't they? If, if we're talking about if we're talking about a wage bill of three or four, three hundred and fifty, four hundred million quid, or take out Tuchel and take out whoever they've had to pay off, that's still only twenty, thirty million quid. They're still going to be at three hundred and fifty, three sixty. If they've got one hundred and fifty million pound of depreciation, they're at five hundred million pounds. Well, I suppose they're just about inside, aren't they? Yeah, just about inside. Yeah, Kim, you mentioned it. It was a matter of time. Super League. Uh, there's Danny and Weymouth. If the Super League was to raise its head again, would the likes of United and City now say, "Yeah, we're the big boys, and we're going to do it now because we 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 spend what we earn"? I, I I don't think so because the optics are so bad. If you if you are seen to be trying to join Super League, um, I think what the clubs will be looking for is somebody else within Europe to take the lead, and. If you've got a Super League and it is between Spanish, Italian, French, I'm not convinced German clubs would go for it because the backlash from fans there would be so hostile. But if it starts to be a success, similarly to playing matches overseas, which I think is the next you know, genie to pop out of the bottle, yeah. if Real Madrid can do it and they're generating £15 million a match in terms of revenues, we don't want to do it, but we've got to do it to be competitive. And, and they'll be using what's happening elsewhere in Europe as a, as a, as a Trojan horse to, to get it through. And let me throw this at you, Kieran. Is this why we're going to see Premier League, whether he likes it or not, Premier League games going abroad? When, when they think it's acceptable to win the PR war, I think that, that will be brought into the equation. <laughs> the PFA has warned that it would oppose any hard cap on player wages, but we'll wait to see the full details of the proposal. Simon, should the PFA even be at the table? Well, in my view, or in the view of, of um, a diplomacy and a temperate outlook amongst when the When have you team. ever been diplomatic? Well, in my view, there's no necessity for them to be at the table because um, the balancing of finances in football clubs and the squad capping that's potentially suggested will not really affect their members. They can turn around and suggest it's a thin, ed- a thin edge of the wedge that will ultimately lead to a different dynamic. The fact of the matter is, is I don't think the PFA comes to the table with any particular... They're not interested in solutions, they're interested in telling you what they don't want. And if you listen to the PFA, and I had the misfortune of having listened to them for 10 years, so much so that I banned them from every training ground and environment I could possibly ban them from because I had zero tolerance of their nonsense and have a zero respect for their involvement in football, I'm sure that certain players perceive them to be valuable. The modern-day footballer doesn't perceive much value of them because if they didn't if they had to pay their membership fees in line with most unions none of them would be probably be members so no I don't think there's any place for them but in the optics of trying to create less background noise maybe they'll the football fraternity will endure their rubbish their rubbish Kieran do you see it like that because I do know you do work in this area don't you are you at liberty to tell us more um I I teach on the master's courses which are run by the PFA for um existing players players looking to transition out of the dressing room into the boardroom because like that's whom? one Can area. Can you give us a few names? Um, Jordan Henderson, Ben Davis, Ilkay Gundahan, um, Tim Krull. Yeah, there's 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 a lot of players. Um, and if you take a look at what we've seen in Europe, you know the number of former players who have become executives in the game is is quite significant. You look at clubs such as Bayern and, and Ajax and so on. Because I think those players have an understanding of the culture of football, which investors who are perhaps coming from a private equity or hedge fund background don't have. And therefore, I think they can add value. Um, and, and there's more to players. You know, some of them are really smart. You know, I've, I've got to know them. And you get to know them as human beings as opposed to commodities, which is the way we traditionally see players as, you know, from, from the lens as a fan. Um, there's there's some really smart guys there who I think can can add something to to the football industry. And can the PFA add anything to this, or could they bring down the whole house of cards here? They have an existing agreement with the Premier League and the EFL in terms of uh, the proportion of wages or, or wage issues, and we saw that during COVID when clubs tried to impose a wage cap, and and the PFA took them to tribunal and successfully won their case they're not trying to be luddites and they're fully aware that their members are certainly at premier league level are extremely well looked after and i don't think there'll be too much of a kickoff when they actually see the details of the numbers they're just saying don't don't impose this 
we have an existing agreement and, and we need to sign off on it. Does that not give you a, a, a degree of optimism, Simon, when you hear Kieran saying there, there are a number of players, and he's even named a few of them, and we constantly criticise players for maybe they play football, they earn a lot of money, full stop. There's a whole bunch of them want to educate themselves no, on the financial it, but, side of it. But that's not it. the position I come from. I'm well, I'm well versed in the fact that players aren't stupid. I'm well versed in the fact that players are rounded. I'm well versed in businesses like VSI that are running directors' courses for football players, where people like Fabrice Moambo have been on these sites and have the intellectual capacity to want to be able to look beyond the basic fundamentals of being a football player in an institutional environment where you don't get taught anything besides football. Yeah, that, but they, when you get a chance, you have a swipe at some of them, like no, Vardy at the top of the show. Yeah. Well, well, that's, what's we started that, the show talking about Jimmy Vardy. But context is everything. Mm. So, so. Most of the time, when I talk about footballers, you're characterising the situation. You're framing me with, what do you think of Jack Grealish standing on the side of the road in a pair of slippers having crashed his Range Rover? What am I supposed to say to that then? Oh, I can see a director of football in the making there. Of course I'm going to turn around and say well, it's ridiculous behaviour. But on the other side of the argument, you know, you look at the, the fact that this idea that is perpetuated by people that footballers are stupid is never an idea I've alighted upon. I think their behaviour... That's, it, that's ultimately encouraged by lionisation through media and fans of everything they do is right, is a flawed concept and people need to grow up and stop behaving that way towards footballers because they're just footballers and treat them with the, the, the prerequisite amount of respect for their profession but not the lionisation of them. But this idea that you're trying to characterise that I would say that every footballer sh shouldn't be able to develop into a, a commercial man is just a silly characterisation and the PFA may well do that but so do private entities like VSI that I've spoken at and spoken to footballers and seen that there's a vast array of highly educated, cosmopolitan, well financially healed footballers that are doing rather well. But that's got nothing to do with the question that you've raised about the PFA's contribution to the equation about what football's trying to evolve into. The PFA should not be funded the way they're funded. They should not be getting 1% of the broadcast deal. That should, they should be getting funded like every other union, which is from the contributions of their members. You have a view on that, Kieran? Without the players, we wouldn't have a game. So they've, they've got an existing contract. I, if I was the PFA, I would not give up those, that exi those existing rights. Well, of course they wouldn't. But what I'm saying is the fundamental flaw is, is that if the union was funded, like they don't have the God-given right to be funded like no other union. And for some reason in 2000, Gordon Taylor was able to leverage the players and the Premier League on the eve of a deal to say, I'm going to take my players out and strike unless you give us 1% of the broadcast revenues every single season. Now, if, if they were funded... It could be argued he was smart doing that. Well, I'm sure it could be argued he was smart doing it. It doesn't make it right, and it doesn't make it the right way for a union to be run, because if we're talking about the value of this union and how important it is, go to the players and say to the Premier League footballers, you're going to have to pay, like every other member, 1%, which is the traditional union fees that you'd have paid for being in the NUJ, or someone else would pay for being a member of the ASLEF or whatever else, and then see if you want to be part of a union. None of the Premier League players would pay their dues on that basis. And that's how valuable the PFA is to the players. And the only reason that they worry about the PFA is because someone else is picking up the tab for the union costs. And that, to me, is a fundamental flaw and shows the immaturity of this industry. And it's difficult to contend with if you're an employer on the other side of that union. See the way you said employer there, Kieran. You get the emphasis on that. We know, we get it. Mm. We're going to talk, Kieran. while we have you here, I want to talk Everton, Nottingham Forest and Leicester before you go. But, I mean, on the, the this issue of Premier League clubs agreeing in principle to a cap in spending, there's Neil Rolfe in uh, Bursko who says, uh, guys, c Jim, can you ask Kieran or Simon, how on earth has any club got a chance to gate crash the Super 6 if they want to keep it a closed shop? Football is dying in front of the fans' eyes with no hope for any other team. I wish they'd just gone to their Super League and left us all alone. I, I, I see that viewpoint increasingly. Um, I think we were all united as fans when Super League was effectively imposed, or the idea. Um, what we have in reality, I'm, I'm old enough to remember Derby County, Blackburn Rovers, Nottingham Forest, Aston Villa, Everton, all winning the top division on merit. And at the start of the season, they're realistically being 12 to 14 teams. You say, well, they've, they've recruited well. That doesn't exist anymore. I think as far as fans based in the UK is concerned, there's many fans of the non-Big Six clubs who aren't happy about it. I'm fortunate enough that I, I work overseas an awful lot. That view is not shared. They just want to see the same three or four clubs winning trophies. So it's it's part of a globalisation issue. Sure. 
I mentioned Everton and Nottingham Forest. Their appeals, Kieran, are ongoing. Um, but with the rules and punishments for FFP set to change imminently, have they been victims of bad timing in all of this? Yes, because if Nottingham Forest or and or Everton had spent the amount of money that they have done 12 years ago before the introduction of FFP in in a similar way to what we've seen with with uh, Chelsea and Manchester City Roman Abramovich it cost him 900,000 pounds a week for 19 years to have effectively a free car park at Stamford Bridge um and, and to fund the club and, and you saw the amount of money that was being spent on wages and the ability of those clubs to to spend a lot of money on players those players not work out and you you say just just go to your apartment and play FIFA and we'll sign somebody else on forty million on a forty million deal. Those days have gone. So Forrest and Everton have been on the wrong side of time. I see, I see. One quick one I want to squeeze out of you, Kieran, before you go. And quite a few people asking me this. On the subject of Leicester City, how joined up will Premier League and EFL financial rules be going forward? Because Leicester, we know, heading to the Premier League, and they're free to trade. But of course, uh, that's because they've got themselves out of the EFL and the embargo that went with that. One rule for one, one rule for another, isn't it? It is. Um, don't be surprised if once uh, a Leicester City become a member of the Premier League, which will happen when there's effectively a transfer of shares from Sheffield United to Leicester and two other clubs to two other clubs, that the Premier League will say, on the basis of our calculations, we believe that you breached, now you're back as a member of the Premier League, We you breached the three-year target, the three year, £105 million limit to the 30th of June 2023. Come into our office, let's have a chat. And there's trouble around the corner no matter what? Yes, if, it, when, if they hadn't gone up, I think they would have been charged by the EFL because they would have then been a member. They are now going to return to being a member, a shareholder of the Premier League, and they come within the Premier League's wheelhouse and potential charges arising. Kieran, when it comes to numbers, there's nobody like you. You know, it's it's a, a huge amount in the Euro Millions tonight. You couldn't write out your, your numbers before you go, could you, mate? Just leave them with me. <laughs> Kieran Maguire with his live on TalkSport. On AM, on DAB, via the TalkSport app and on your smart speaker. TalkSport.